Hello and welcome to a video from FilmsByChris.com. That's Chris with the K. I'm Chris with the K. Today we're going to create a very simple video game using Godot version 4.3. Godot is a great open source game engine, very easy to use, very lightweight, and is just spectacular. Uh, you can get Godot if you don't already have it at GodotEngine.org, and it's spelt Godot is spelt G-O-D-O-T, like Go Dot engine.org. Download, and again, I'm working with version 4.3 here, so you'll want to get that if you're going to follow along with this tutorial. We're going to use assets from Kenny, that's Kenny.nl. There's lots of game assets, both 2D and 3D here you can get that are free to use. Uh, also some sounds. Uh, I've already downloaded them. So to get the starter game, so I've already downloaded some graphics and sounds, go to my website. There should be a link in the description, but filmsbychris.com forward slash scripts forward slash 2024. And there's a mouse underscore games dot zip. Go ahead and download that. Once you have it downloaded, open up Godot. This is what you'll see. We're going to say import and then just navigate to wherever you downloaded that zip file from. Choose that zip file and click open. You'll get this and then just click import and edit. Give it a moment to extract everything and load up. And then once it does, we have this basic setup here. You can see that we have some sounds and images that I've already set up for you. Let's go ahead and start creating our 2D game here. Let's go ahead and create a 2D scene and we're gonna call it Map 01 because it's gonna be our first level. Now, I like uh, for most of my games a black background. We're gonna go up to projects and change some project settings. You can change the name of your game here to whatever you'd like and you can also change the icon. I already have a little mouse icon set up for you. Let's go ahead and first let's go to Window and resize this. Uh, we're just going to do 720 by 480 for our resolution and I, get, I like my games just to go full screen. If you're going to play a video game, <laughs> why wouldn't you play it full screen? Once we have that set, the only th thing we're going to change in here is uh, stretch mode. Let's go ahead and just set this to viewport. Okay, so we changed the resolution, made it full screen and set the viewport. Now let's go down and we're looking for environment and we're going to change the default color uh, clear color and I'm just going to make it black. I just think that looks good. So one or two other things we're going to change in here later on but let's go ahead and just close for right now. So we have a blank canvas to work with here. We're going to say uh, we're going to right click on our map object here, add a child and we'll type in tile and what we're going to want is tile map layer, not ma tile map but tile map layer. Create that. With it selected we're going to come over here to the right where it says tile set where it says empty, we will click that and click new tile set. Now we can click on where it says tile set. Right away, we're gonna to wanna to add some physics to this because we want our player to be able to collide with it, right? So we're gonna add an element. Here we have collision layer and collision mask. Collision layer is the layer that this object is on. Collision mask is the things it's going to collide with. Let's go ahead, something you don't have to do but is helpful because right now they're just numbered. If we click these three dots here, we can say edit layer names. And I'm gonna set up, give names to some of these layers. I'm gonna say players for layer one, map for player or for layer two, and I'll say collectibles for layer three. Those are gonna be coins or any other bonuses you can pick up. I'm gonna go ahead and hit close now. And that's just for your reference. When you hover over these now, they'll tell you what layer it is by name so you can keep things organized. But since this is our map, we're going to have it set on two. So our, our tile set is on two and it's gonna collide with one and three. Uh, so now that we have that, we will center click. So click on your mouse wheel, drag around and then scroll to zoom in a little bit. Now we have again our tile set selected. So we have this down here and we have down here, we have options. These last two were on tile map and tile set. We wanna to go to tile set. And then in our little tree here, we're gonna to go to objects and mouse. That's just where I have the one whole tile that has all the graphics for this game in one thing. Uh, sometimes I would divide these out, but it's just, this is a very small game we're working with. We're just gonna drag this monochrome tile set. We're just gonna work, create a basic little black and white game, a little pixel game. And we will click yes to uh, uh, create tiles in the Atlas. And now we can zoom in here and you can see all the different things. So I'm just scrolling to zoom. We have these different tiles. Uh, from our map to other objects and our mouse here that was going to be our main player. Let's go ahead and select this tile right here, this little ground tile. Uh, we can scroll through here. Let's actually click select, select it again. And now we'll go down to physics, physics layer zero. And in here, you can see that tile that we have selected. So whichever tile we have selected, we want to set up 
what parts of this our player can collide with, because we don't want them colliding with the empty spot here. So we're first going to turn on our grid. So you see the little magnet here? We're going to click that, and we're going to grid snap. And now we can see our grid. Press the green icon here, and we're just going to draw over this top part here a little rectangle. That is what our player will collide with. At this point, let's go ahead and hit Control S to save and put this under Scenes. I have a folder created for you called Scenes. We're just going to save it as Map01. Save. Perfect. Let's click on our uh, tile map layer again. And now we're going to, again, choose that same icon that we just, or same tile that we just set collision for. And you can see if we have the little pencil selected here, we can start drawing our map. But if I zoom in here, you can see it looks a little blurry. See, we're working with pixel art, so we need to tell Godot that we're working with pixel art. So it doesn't look blurry like that. It's trying to smooth the edges. With pixel art, you don't want that. We're going to go to Project Settings. And in here, we're just going to look for tile. Now, there's a little filter here. We can type in, or not tile, but textures. Texture. So I'll just type in text, and we can see render texture. And then here, where it says canvas texture, and we have default texture filter, we're going to set this to nearest. We're going to hit close, and already you can see it's not blurry anymore. Nice straight pixels. We're drawing our map here. If we hit F5, it will start the game, but it needs to know what our default scene is. Currently, we just have one scene, our map. We're going to say select the current scene, so from here on out, it will start by loading this map. Do that, and this is our map. You can see our tile is up. Our map is up here in the top left. We can close this. Uh, with Alt F4 on a lot of systems or Windows Q depending on how your system is set up. And um, this is our viewport, this purple or this blue box here. We're not going to use that. We're going to add a camera. So click on our map one, right click it, say add child and type in camera. And we want the camera 2D, not the camera 3D, the camera 2D because we're making a 2D game. And there you can see it's right there. This purple one is our camera. It's kind of zoomed out, so with the camera selected over here on the right, we're going to change this to 2, and now we're zoomed in even more. And if we hit F5, there is our map. We can, with our camera selected, click the little uh, red uh, cross in the middle here, and we'll drag that up. Let's go ahead and select our tile map again, and with that same tile selected and the pencil, and we can scroll to zoom in, we'll draw a little bit more of our map. You left click to draw and right click if you want to erase something. There's other options, fill buckets and stuff like that uh, down here. We're not going to mess with that too much. Let's go ahead, draw another little platform here, little platform here, and maybe another one right here. Okay, if we hit F5, we can see what that looks like. Great. Again, Alt F4 to close your window or whatever key combination because we haven't set, we're going full screen, but we haven't set an exit key yet. Uh, we'll worry about that later on. For right now, let's go ahead and add in another object. So we press the little plus sign, and here we're not going to choose one of these. We're going to choose other node, and we're going to type in character. And we have a character body 2D. We will select that. We'll click it to rename it. We'll just call it player. You'll see a little yellow exclamation mark here, warning of some things. Don't worry about that just yet. Let's go ahead and center click and scroll to zoom in a little bit. Let's add in our graphics for our player. So we're going to right click and say add child and we're going to type in sprite. Sprite. And we're going to choose there's sprite 2D and animated sprite 2D. Depending on what you do you may want to choose the other. We're going to go animated sprite 2D. More complicated games I might go with a sprite 2D and animate it a different way. But let's go ahead and just choose that and click here just to shorten it up. I'm just going to call it sprite. At this point with the sprite selected we can come over here to animation and you can see sprite frames. Click on this and say new sprite frames. Now we click on where we have the sprite frames there and we have our default set here. What we want to do now is choose this little grid icon. Now we need to find our graphics. For this project under objects mouse we have the monochrome tile map which has all our graphics. We will choose that and it shows everything and we need to divide this up for so each item is in its own little box. This particular graphic is each box, each tile is 16 by 16. So over here where it says size we want to change that to 16 by 16 and now you can see our grid. In here we want to hit control and scroll 
to zoom in. And for our idle app, our default animation, our idle animation, I think we're going to choose these four little animation frames here. Once you have them selected in that order, 0, 1, 2, 3, and you can change that later on if you want, we'll click Add Frames. Now we have our little graphic there. At this point, we can add uh, collision detection. So with our player here, we'll, we'll right click on player, say Add Child, and we'll type in Collision, and we want a collision shape. 2D. We'll choose that, click Create. We'll exclamation mark next to that because we need to set a shape. So over here to the right, we have shape. We're going to click where it says empty. I'm sorry, click the drop down here. Yeah. And we're going to change this to whatever shape fits what we're doing. Most time characters, you're going to want uh, a capsule. This guy's kind of round. We could use a circle, but I'm going to go capsule. At this point, this is where he's going to collide with anything else in the game. So we want to make our collision mainly to his body. We want to make sure this bottom dot is lined up with the bottom of his feet. And we don't care if his ears hit anything, but we don't want his body going through anything. Uh, so now we have that set. We will hit Control S and decide where to save this. We'll go up and into Objects, Mouse, and we'll just leave this named as Player.TSCN. Save. Now we could add him to our scene, but he has no programming yet. So let's go ahead and right click on Player and we'll attach a script. Since we chose a character 2D for this, it asks, do you want to use the character 2D uh, template? And although in a more advanced game, I would completely rewrite all this, it is a good way to start. So we're just gonna click Create. And this is our script. We'll hit Control S to save. And if we come back up to this tab here and go to our map and choose 2D, and then in our tree over here, we can go to Resources, Objects, Mouse, and we have our player, not the GD, but the TSCN, that's our scene, our player object. We'll put him right there. So there's our mouse. And if we hit F5, we can now use, oh, forgot to tell him what to collide into. <laughs> uh, so go ahead and close our window here. Go back to our player tab here. And with our player selected, we're gonna come over here to collision, not this collision up here, but this collision right here. And he is going to be on one and he's going to collide with two and three. Now, if we hit F5, there we go. Now he's colliding with the ground. We can use left and right arrow to move him and space to jump. He is kind of moving kind of fast. So let's go ahead and adjust this. And I also would like him to jump a little bit lower because we might give him a double jump later on. So let's go back here after closing our game window. We're going to choose our script here and we're going to change his speed to 150 and his jump velocity to negative 300. If we hit F5 now, I can run space to jump there. Oh, we might need to make this platform a little bit longer until we actually add our double jump in. So let's go back to map, choose our tile set here, go to 2D. Make sure we have that tile selected and it's on draw. And there we go. So now we'll hit F5 and our character will jump like so. He's not animated though, right? We gave him an animation, a idle animation, but it's not working. Let's go ahead and close this, go back to our player, choose our sprite and click this little A here. That means automatic, this is the default. Now, if we hit F5, you'll see that he is animated. Now we want to create a run animation. Let's go ahead and hit, uh, again, Alt F4 or whatever you use to close. And what we're going to do now is we are going to add a run animation. So again, choose our sprite here. Come over here to animation sprite frames. Click on this. Uh, and if it doesn't pop up, go to sprite frames. <laughs> we'll click new and we will rename this new animation to run. Now we will choose our little grid icon here, choose the same image as before. And uh, it should remember 16 by 16. If you've closed out Godot and come back in, it may not say that anymore. So make sure that's set to 16 by 16. Press control and scroll. And now we can choose our run animation. I'm gonna choose these three frames here. Run. Now, We've set it so he has a run animation, but now we need to do some coding. So let's go into our player, click on the little icon here to bring up the player script. 
And down here, these are the basic controls that were set. So here it's saying, okay, uh, if he's not on the floor, you know, add up uh, gravity. If uh, you press a certain key and he is on the floor, then basically make him go up. That's the jump. Check out uh, your left and right buttons. If they're pressed, then make them go in that direction at a certain speed. So we're going to change all that in a little bit. But for right now, let's come down here. Now, Godot script is indentation sensitive. So for example, if I was to come in here and put a tab there, I just broke the script. And we'll tell you right there with the red in some cases. So we have to make sure that our indentations are right. Um, but here, what we're going to do here is we're going to do an if statement. And if statement's going to check if something is true or false. Uh, so we're going to say if, and it will do auto completion for you. Uh, we're going to say velocity dot x. So velocity is how fast he's moving. X is left and right. Y is up and down. So we're saying if his velocity does not equal zero, which means he's moving, what are we going to do? Well, actually, let's go ahead and for right now, we're going to drag our sprite. Let's drag it over here, okay? And what we're going to do actually on here, we're going to say at on ready var sprite equals sprite. What do we do? So this dollar sign sprite is talking about the sprite over here in the tree. Uh, and we can use that in our script, but it's good to set a variable in case you move it somewhere in your tree. Now we have a variable. Anytime we say sprite, it's going to be talking about our image, right? Well, what we're going to do down here, we're going to say if he's not zero, so if he is moving, sprite.play, what are we going to play? The run animation. Okay? And again, indentation is important. Now we're going to say else colon. And let's say I forgot to put a colon there. And I start typing sprite dot play and this one I'll say default there we go I was waiting for it to give me an error it tells you right here okay error line 27 at character 9 we are expecting a colon after the else it tells you right there what the problem is if you don't understand it you can always google that or whatever search engine you want so now we're saying this is just saying if he's moving use the run animation if he's not then use the default animation We'll hit F5. Here we go. Now he's running. Now he's running, but he's running backwards. <laughs> so two things I would change here. One, we have to flip his animation. And I don't know if this looks jerky with, with the uh, screen recorder. He's, he's uh, moving smoothly, though. We need to flip his animation. I also want to speed up his run animation. So close this window. With our sprite animation here, uh, we'll go here. We'll go 2D. Uh, with our sprite selected, we'll come down here to animation. And what did I do wrong here? There we go. Had to click on, click off it and click back on it for some reason. Let's go ahead and take his run animation, right? And we have frames per second here set to five. Let's set that to 10. Now he'll run a little quicker. The animation, he won't move quicker. The animation will play quicker. Let's go back up to our script here. Now we're going to flip it. So we're going to say if, again, we're going to work with our velocity dot x. So his movement left, left and right. If it is less than zero, what are we going to do? We're going to say our sprite, our image dot flip h for horizontal equals true. Got to spell true properly. Then we're going to say else sprite dot flip horizontal, so h, equals false. So what this is saying is, if he's moving in to the left, so if less than zero, flip the image. If not, flip it back. Don't flip it. You know, set it back to default. Now if I hit F5, we can move him this way, and we can move him that way. And I can hit spacebar to jump. So still things we need to do, uh, but I think this is a good stopping point for this first tutorial. I will have more in the future. I thank you for watching. Visit filmsbychris.com. That's Chris of the K. There's a link in the description. As always, I hope that you have a great day. Hello and welcome to this video from filmsbychris.com. That's Chris of the K. I'm Chris of the K. This is part two in a series. We're creating a very, very basic little platform jumper 
in Godot Game Engine. Uh, Godot Ga Game Engine, again, is a great game engine, free, open source, and it uh, does both 2D and 3D games. We are going very simple with our graphics today and stuff, but we're just, this is for people who are brand new to game development. Be sure to watch the previous video. This is what we have so far. We can use left and right arrows to move our character around, and I can hit space bar to jump. We're gonna do a few more things. Uh, one thing, at this point, uh, we have it set so the game goes full screen, but we don't have an exit button. And on most systems, you can hit Alt F4. You may have something else set up to close windows. So when the game's open, hit Alt F4 if you don't know how to get out of it. We're gonna set it up so we can hit press escape to get out of it, because maybe people don't know about Alt F4. Uh, so let's go in here. And that's one of the things we're gonna do. We're also gonna change the controls a little bit. Maybe add some sounds. So we're in our game here. Let's go up to project here. So, well, actually, let's look at our player script. So click on our player tab, player, player script. And here we have things like UI accept, UI left, UI right. These are preset in Godot. We're gonna make our own here though, because UI accept to jump is silly. Accept is space, but that's just a silly name for it. Okay, so we're gonna go in here. So let me do that again in case. Project, project settings. We're gonna go to the input map. And here you can map any keyboard, mouse, or game controller presses into uh, your game. <laughs> so here I'm gonna type in left, hit enter, right, and I'm gonna say jump. And then we'll also say exit, okay? So let's go to the left here. We press this little plus sign and it opens up this window. And then you can take your keyboard or mouse or game controller and press a key. So in this case, I'm gonna press the left arrow. At this point, I'll click okay. But I don't want just left arrow. I'm gonna press that again and I'm gonna press A because many games use A as left. Uh, and then I also have a game controller, so I'm gonna click this, and I'm gonna click the left arrow on my D-pad. And then we'll click, and it's set to all devices by default. You can set specific devices. Uh, I don't know if we're gonna get into multiplayer stuff on here. We're just gonna leave it as all devices. I would always use all devices because I usually map out different players in code, not in this interface. But we'll click okay. So now the player can press, well, once we change the code, they press left A, or the left arrow on a gamepad, any of the gamepads hooked up, to go left. Let's do the same thing for right. So I'll do right arrow, okay, plus the plus again. I'll do D, okay, and then I'll press the plus arrow again, and on my game controller, press the right arrow. Now we're gonna do jump. I'm going to go ahead, I'll leave space as an option, but I also just like pressing up. So in this case, arrow up, W for up, and on our game controller, I'll just press one of the buttons, button Nintendo A or Xbox B. Okay, so we have some jump buttons. And then we wanna be able to exit, right? So we're going to click this, I'm gonna hit escape and click okay. So our escape key will be our exit button. We still have to program it though. We'll click close. In here, now we need to update our controls here. For here, all we have to do in uh, input is action just pressed, jump. And then for this input get axis left and right, we're going to go left and right. Okay, now if I hit F5, I can press left arrow, right arrow, or the up arrow to jump. I can do A, D, or W to jump. I can hit space bar to jump. I can pick up any of my game pads and I can press left and right and press the A button or B button depending on how they're mapped out on your game controller to jump. Great. And we still have to hit Alt F4 or whatever keys you have to exit out of programs. Let's go ahead and click on our map here and click on our map and we're gonna say attach a script. We're gonna put this in our scenes directory and we'll just call it map. This will be our basic script for all our maps because we might make multiple levels. We'll click create. And in here under process, we're going to say if input with a capital uh, I dot is action just pressed and we're going to say exit and then here we're going to say get tree dot quit so in real case scenario when you're in your map you're going to set when you hit escape to go back to a main menu we don't have a main menu but all this is saying this is your process this is constantly being looped and checked it's waiting here okay if you press an input and if that pre input was just pressed and it's the exit button, which in our case is escape, which should probably map something to game controllers as well, but right now we'll just do escape. What are we gonna do? We're gonna get our game tree. Your game tree is this over here. This is a tree when you ever have any things that fold in and out like this. So this is your game tree. And what are we gonna do? We're gonna say quit. 
That's it. And we can get rid of this pass now. That pass is just a placeholder holder if you don't have anything in this function. So fun is function. This is the name of a built-in function. So now if I hit F5, we'll start our game. And if I hit the escape key, our game exits. And of course, if we made a menu, we want to go to the menu. And then maybe from the menu, if you press escape again, it will exit whatever we want. Because we're, we're the programmers. We can make this do whatever we want. Great. Let's add some sounds to our game now. Oh, no. You know what? Let's do one other thing first. I'm going to set it up so that, uh, see, if I hit F5 now, you can see my mouse cursor. And there might be games where you want to see your mouse cursor or make your own custom mouse cursor. This game, we don't want to see the mouse cursor. So let's go ahead and fix that real quick. So what we're going to do here is um, we're going to set it when the map starts. So in this ready, once the map is ready, we're going to say input dot set. And again, it does auto completion for you. What we want is set underscore mouse. It's not auto completing correctly. So let me just continue typing what I was going to type mouse mode. And we're going to set input dot mouse mode hidden. I don't know why I didn't auto complete mouse mode. There was another mouse cursor. I don't know if that's just a newer version. I'm just going off old memory stuff. But if I hit F5 now, let's see. Okay, our mouse is missing. I don't know why it didn't autocomplete properly there. But that's the code to hide your mouse. We can still hit escape to get out of that. So our game's already looking better, right? It's going full screen. We can escape to exit. There's no mouse cursor. We can use a game controller or our keyboard to move our mouse around. Let's go ahead and go to our player. Right click on player. And we're going to add a child. And we're going to say audio. And what we want, we want audio stream player 2D, not 3D or just audio player 2D. Uh, 2D will make it so the sound will come out of the proper speaker. So if the action happens on the left side of the screen, it comes more out of your left ear and or goes into your left ear, I guess. On the right side of the screen, it will be on the right side. So let's go ahead and just rename this jump or JMP, whatever if you want to abbreviate like I do. Uh, and if we look in our resources, objects, mouse, I have a jump sound here for you. With this selected, we'll drag this over into the stream where it says empty. Great, that's there. Now we just need to set it to play. And we will do that here. So input, this is where we have our jump uh, options for. And in a bigger game, you would break this down. You might have a function for controls like jump and move left and right. It's a very simple game. We're doing everything basically in one function here. Uh, but we can say dollar sign jmp.play and now if I hit F5 and I don't have my recording set to record the output of my computer so I will just make sure that it's playing and I turn the volume up oh we didn't did, we did put it in our code let's see let's see what's happening here so we have jump play that's our sound and so when we jump it should make a sound let me put my headphones on real quick here. No, it's not playing through my headphones. Did I... Oh, okay. My computer was muted. Let's turn that down a little bit. So that's the sound. That's just the sound I put in there for you. You can adjust the pitch. So that's kind of high pitched. Let's uh, adjust it down a little bit. Let's see how this sounds. I don't know. But now, great. Okay. So now we have sounds for our character. Let's add uh, a coin for us to collect. So it's something for us to do. Or should we continue with jumping? Let's add double jump, and then we'll add coins. Okay. So let's come up here. Let's create a variable. Now I added this dollar sign JMP, which says look at the in the tree here, something called JMP and play it. You can do that, but what might be a more proper way is to give this a name. So I'm gonna say SND JMP, I just like to abbreviate stuff. And up here I'm gonna say at on ready var for variable SND JMP equals, and then again, you can just drag this over. And again, that way, we're, we're very simple here, but if we got more complex and we had a lot of different things and we drug this into a, uh, a, a different place, uh, we would have to change it in multiple places possibly. This says, okay, we can just change it in one place and it'll apply to the rest of the script. So we're doing the same thing. We added a line of code. It's up to you on how you do that for a simple little game like this. Let's make sure we did everything properly though. 
Great. Let's do a double jump. Let's create a variable. We'll call it, we'll have a variable up here. We'll call it var, and we'll say double, oops, spell it right, underscore jump, and we'll set that to true. So at this point, they can double jump. Uh, and then what we're going to do down here is we're going to say L if, and let's just copy and paste some of this. We're going to say this. And you can do ampersand, ampersand, or take the word and. It just means and this. So you're looking at two things that are true. So we're going to say double jump, colon. And then at that point, we can do this. But we also want to, at that point, hit double jump equals false. And up here, and I'm going to explain all this in a second, double, double jump equals true. I did something wrong. It's complaining. Uh, so, oh, I abbreviated when I, I'm not abbreviating anymore. There we go. So as I say, okay, again, this is in our physics loop. This is constantly looping. Uh, we come down here and it says, if input action, just press jump. So if you press jump, but we don't want it to happen anytime. Let me do this. Understand, understand. This is saying, and. So it's looking for two things to be true. Both these things have to be true. You're pressing whatever jump buttons you set up, and the player is on the floor. This is a built-in function that checks to make sure the player is on the floor. Because if you got rid of that, and you press the jump button multiple times, you would just keep flying. Okay, if both those things are true, if he's on the floor and you press the jump button, we're gonna make sure that double jump is set to true. That will reset it for us anytime we need it. It will play the sound, and a velocity, Y, remember Y is up and down, jump velocity, which is a variable up here, set to negative 300. So it's going to make our player go up. Now we have input is action press jump. So we're still checking, did they press jump? Now we don't care if they're on the floor, but we're checking, is double jump true? If it is, then allow them to jump a second time to do a double jump. But as soon as you do that, you want to make sure you hit set double jump to false. Okay? Because if you don't, again, you have that scenario where you're flying. I, I can show you that. If I was to comment this out, so any line with a pound symbol there is a comment, means it's not going to run. So now if I run this and I come over here, if I keep hitting up, I'm flying. If you want to fly, there you go. But if we set it to false, we can come over here and now it's set to true. As soon as I hit the button the second time, it's going to set it to false until we jump again from the floor. So I can keep on hitting it. So it's only allowing me to do a double jump. Okay, so we have double jump, great, with sound effects. Let's go ahead and create some coins to collect. We're gonna create a new scene, we're gonna press the plus button here. Uh, we're gonna say uh, new 2D scene, we'll call this coin. And then we're gonna come down here and under objects coin, I have a coin image and I have a uh, coin sound. Let's go to 2D here, this is our coin scene. Let's just go ahead and right click, add sprite. We'll add a 2D sprite. And we will also add in a, an area 2D. And to the area 2D, we will add a collision shape. Now, let's select our sprite and drag over this coin image right here to texture where it says empty. Drag and drop that. We have our coin. Let's collect on, click on our collection or collision shape. <laughs> and here, uh, again, for this, we'll choose <clears throat> capsule again, and we will shrink it down so that it fits our coin here. Great. We also want to make sure if we choose our area 2D, we are going to say collision. Collectibles are going to be on three, and it's going to co collide with player one, basically. Uh, any player, because we might have multiple players. At this point, we're going to come over here to where it says node. Let's go ahead, select our coin. Let's go ahead and say group. And we're going to add this to a group. We're going to say plus sign. We'll say collectibles. And we'll make that a global group. And for our players, let's go ahead and just make sure that they're in a group plus. So we have our players selected. We're going to say players. This will allow us to, anytime we want to check all of our players, they're all in a group that we can check. Let's go back to our coin here. We'll press Control S to save. Let's press up arrow until we're in our objects directory. Go to coin, and we'll just save the scene as coin. Great. 
Now, we have our player here, we have our coin. With our coin, we're going to now set a signal. So select your coin, actually select your area 2D, make sure we click on node, and then signals. And down here, our player has a body. So we're gonna say, when a body is entered, we're gonna double click this, and then, oh, gotta add a script to our coin. Right click our coin and say, attach a script, and we'll save it as uh, coin.gd, create. Now, click on our area 2D, node, signals, body entered. And down here, we'll just leave that as the default, or you can call it collected or whatever you want. But right now it's saying, okay, anytime it collides with a body that's on a layer that we said it would, which is one, which should just be players, uh, but it's a good idea to check. Right here, body is what it's colliding with. So just to double check, even though we put it, uh, players on their own collision layer, what I can do here, just double check, I'm gonna say if body dot is in group, and here in quotations we'll say players. Actually, let's say not true, then return. All depends on how you wanna do it. Avoiding more indentations, what we're doing here. So we're saying if the Exclamation mark means not true. So if here we're saying, is this in the group of players? So the thing that touches the coin, is it, in, is it a player? But here we're saying, exclamation mark, we're saying, if it's not a player, return. Just exit out of this function. If it is a player, well then we're gonna take that body dot coins and we're going to add equals one to it. Don't need that semicolon at the end. Control S. Now to do that, we're gonna come over here to players and we're going to create a variable for this player, coins equals zero. We're not going to see this in this particular tutorial, but when, now when the coin is collected, they will uh, add a, a, a coin to that player. And then we're going to say uh, Q free. That will delete the coin. Save that, go to map, go to our tile map here, 2D, find our coin, make sure it's coin T S C N and drag and drop it right there. Now let's go here and just see if we did everything right. The coin disappears, but we wanted to make a noise when we collect it, right? So let's go back to our coin here and we're going to add a child. We're going to choose audio stream player 2D. Let's go ahead and just rename this to SND or sound, whatever you want to call it. Choose it. Make sure we're on inspector over here. You can see stream is empty. Drag over this coin sound. And now let's go to the script for the coin. And what we can say down here is dollar sign SND, right? So that's going to be our sound. And we're going to say dot play. The problem here though is if we try to do this, you're not going to hear the sound. And actually let's go to our map and move that coin down a little bit so that we don't have to jump. But there's no sound. Why is there no sound? Well, it goes to play the sound, but before it has a chance to play, we're removing the coin. So it deletes everything from it, including its sound. So what we can do here is choose our sound in our coin. We're going to come over here to node, signals, finished. This will create a function that when the sound is done playing, then it will do something. So we're going to choose that and we're going to say unfinished. We can do that or we can rename it. We can call it something like remove. Okay. Connect. And now we can remove, we can take this free cue and move it down here. Now, When we collect the coin, we'll hear the noise, and then after that, it will delete the coin. See, it takes a moment though. So if we were to actually run this again, the problem with this is we can collect that coin multiple times, right? And it doesn't go away until the sound finishes playing. We don't want that. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna, in our coin script, we're going to create a variable called active. We'll set it equal to true. Okay, and then down here, we're going to say if it's the player 
and we are active, but we don't want to be active. We want to be not active. Okay, so we're checking untrue things here. Uh, at this point, we're going to say active equals false. So what that will do is if we hit F5 now, if I did everything properly, the coin won't disappear, but we can't. Okay, I did do it wrong. Let's say active. Let's see. Okay, what am I doing wrong? We have active set to true. And here we're checking. Okay, so if it's not the player, okay, that is wrong. Let's try to do it in one. I, I know I can do it in one. What I'm going to say here, here, this is what we do. I said and we want it to be or. So two ampersands, or you can type the word or. I'll type or for you. It might be a little clearer. I like just doing double ampersand or ampersand pipe symbols, not active. Okay. So here we're saying, okay, if it's not the player or if we're not active, then just return, just exit out of this. So now the coin will disappear right away, but we won't be able to collect it more than once. See, and then the sound will disappear. So what we want to do at this point is drag over our sprite. Again, we could create variables for this, but I'm going to take our sprite 2D and I'm going to say dot visible equals false. So when I collect the coin, it will disappear. We'll play the sound disappear. Give me a, a coin, but it, technically it's still there until the sound finishes playing, but we're not going to see it. Great. Um, so let me quickly review this because I know I was a little sloppy in explaining it. We've set it up so that when a body is entered, any object that, that the coin can collide with collides with it, it's going to run this function. It's going to check. If it's not in the player, just return. Or if the coin is not active, just return. That means exit out of this function. Otherwise, it's going to continue. It will set it to inactive to make sure that we can't run this function a second time. We're going to make it invisible. We're going to play a sound and we're going to give the player a coin. The sound is set through signals, through the signal over here, to run this free queue. Uh, we could have called that directly instead of creating a separate function, but there might be other things you want to do when you're removing the coin. So it doesn't hurt to make a new function there. So now we can go back over here and we can go to our map, 2D, map 2D. And let's go ahead and select this coin. I'm gonna go Shift D, Shift D, Shift D. Not lining them up great. There's actually a better way to put them into your map, which we'll go over in a future video. But let me go ahead and hit F5 now. Yay, I can collect coins. Okay, I hope you found this video useful. We'll do some more in this series uh, coming up in future videos. I thank you for watching. As always, uh, visit filmedbychris.com. That's Chris with a K. There's a link in the description. As always, I thank you for watching and I hope that you have a great day. Here we are continuing with our game. Let's go ahead and have a look at our game. I'm gonna hit F5 to start our game up here. We can move around and we can jump. We can double jump and we can collect some coins. Again, this video is from filmsbychris.com. That's Chris the K. I'm Chris the K. There's a link in the description to my website. And uh, yeah, this is part three in a video series. Be sure to check out the previous videos where you can get the assets and follow along to where we're at right now. Uh, we'll hit escape to get out of our game. And we are on our map tab here. And if you've closed everything out, uh, the map will be under scenes is where we put it. And you can always just double tap map 01. So here is our map. We put down coins, but look, they're all, they're all kind of crooked because I placed them by hand. Let's go ahead and just select them all and hit delete. Okay. Our coin still exists over here. It's just not on our map. Let's choose our map and down here under, uh, let's see, tile set. So select our tile map layer, select tile set, say plus and choose where it says scene collection. At that point, we can come over here to our tree and under resources, objects, coin, we can find our coin TSCN and drag that to here. We can now select that and now we can use that to draw, draw to our scene. So we're going to choose this. We're going to click tile map and we can go from our tile here, which right now we're only using one of these tiles. Obviously you can use more in your game. We're just trying to keep things simple. We'll select on our scene collection here. We'll choose this, make sure we're on draw. And now we can go like this and it's going to draw it in a perfect little grid. 
so things aren't crooked. It also prevents us from having a bazillion of them in our tree list here, uh, which can get kind of sloppy. sloppy. F5 to play our game. And yeah, there we go. We're collecting coins. Now, let's add some music to our game, right? So we're gonna say uh, map. I'm gonna right click on our map here. I'm gonna say child and I'm gonna say here, we'll type in audio if you don't already have it typed in. And we're gonna say audio stream player, not 3D or 2D, just audio stream player. This will play it out of both speakers and we'll just rename it by clicking on it here to music. Now we need some music to play. Okay, I'm gonna bring over my file manager so you can grab any MP3 WAV file or AUG file, so just any audio file. And we're gonna drag into our project here. Actually, let's create a folder, put it in. I'm gonna click on resources, right click here, and I'm gonna say create new folder. I'll call it music. And now we have a music folder. I'm gonna come over here, I'm going to drag this music file. It did not go into my music folder. Let's go ahead and now drag it up into our music folder. I can get rid of this window now. Okay, so now we have a folder with our music in it. Again, any MP3 WAV file or AUG file. And we'll choose our music here. We're gonna go over to Inspector here and under Stream, under Empty, we will drag in our music. This is just a quick little song I wrote. And we're gonna say autoplay. So it will start playing as soon as we start our game. to escape. Our game is looking pretty good. We got sounds, we got a, a, a character we can control, things we can collect. Let's go ahead and build up our level a little bit more. So we're going to choose our tile map layer here. We'll go to monochrome uh, map here and then we want to make sure we choose the tile that we've already set although we can create other ones but I'm just going to go with this one which we've already set collisions up for it. Remember in the first video when we set collisions so if you're going to do other tiles and you want the player to collide with them, you're going to want to set that up uh, as well, just like we did in the first video. So I'm going to draw, draw another platform here, another platform here, another platform here. Let's erase this one. We'll go up a little bit higher right there. So now I'll hit F5, start our game, and you'll see I can go up here. Oops. and I'm off the screen. Well, that's no good. I mean, it's fine if you're going to have you go to another screen like you did in old school games, but all we have to do for this is take our camera here and we are going to go ahead and place it on our player. So now it's attached to our player. Now we're also going to line it up how we want to look at our player here. And now it should follow our player. We'll hit F5. So it's following our player. It's, it's very uh, rough and jagged though. So what we want to do now is with the camera selected, we're going to say position, enable smooth. And you can set the speed, but this is going to give a little bit delay. So when the player jumps, the camera isn't locked to it. Uh, so we'll hit F5 now and you'll see the camera smoothly scrolls. So let me set this number a little bit higher just to exaggerate a little bit. I'll set it to 25. We'll hit F5 here. Actually, maybe set it to something lower is what we want. <laughs> Speed, so now it's gonna be super slow. You can see how long it takes to catch up with our player. And if I was to jump down, whoo, you can see how slow it is to catch up with the player. The default is five, let's go ahead and set it back to the five. Anytime you change any settings in any of these menus, you see this little, uh, arrow with a circle, circular arrow here. Uh, if you click that, it'll reset to the, whatever the default is. So you don't have to remember, forget, worry about forgetting what the default is. We'll hit F5. Now, it's smooth, but it's not super slow. And if I was to jump down, it kept up with me pretty well. If I was to fall really far, it might take a second for it to catch up. Uh, so yeah, we're, we have our camera following our player.
escape to get out of that. And again, to link the camera to the player, we just put the camera as a child of the player. And then we said over here, position smoothing, and we're, we're not having the camera rotating, but there is a smoothing for rotating if you have the camera rotate at all. Uh, and yeah, we got a pretty good game going here. This video is a little bit shorter than our previous games, but I think that we're, we're doing well. Uh, I'm going to stop here. Let me know what you think. Put uh, comments in the comment section. And as always, I hope that you have a great day. Hello and welcome to another video from filmsbychris.com. Chris with a K, there's a link in the description of my website. I'm Chris with a K. Here is the game we created so far. This is number four in a video series on creating a basic game with the Godot game engine. We're going 2D here, very simple art style here. We have a player that can double jump and can also collect coins. Uh, our camera follows our player as we move around. <laughs> Sorry, that might be kind of loud. Let's lower that a little bit. So the camera follows our player as he moves around and goes up these platforms. Uh, let's see what happens if our player goes off the edge of the screen here though. He falls and he'll fall forever. So let's hit escape to get out of that. Let's set it up. We could put bounds to the wall, right? We could we could put some individual, invisible barriers here or we could actually build a wall. So like actually if we were to go to our tile map here, choose our tile map here, choose the tile that we've created that has collision detection on it and make sure we're on the paint here. I can come up here and you can see that I have uh, I can paint it here, but let's say I was to do this. There's a rotate button here. Uh, X to rotate right, or I can click that, or Z to rotate left. So I can come up here and I can hit X and it rotates. So now I can draw a wall like this. I can do Z twice and I can draw a wall like this. So now if I hit F5, since that tile has collision, I can create bounds to my map like so. And I can do that all the way up if I want. But just for fun, let's see what happens. Let's set it so that if we run off the edge of the screen and go down too far, it restarts the map. So hit escape. Let's go ahead and erase. Ooh, choose our tile map, tile set, tile map, and we will erase these. So there's a few different ways we can do this. We could put something down here that if the player touches, it restarts the level or we can set if the player goes below a certain amount. Let's just go ahead and add something that will allow the player to detect when it gets hit. Uh, there's a few different ways to do this. I'm just gonna say right click on our map here. I'm gonna add a child. I'm gonna say area 2D. And for this, I'm going to say for its collision, I'm gonna make it on the map layer and it's gonna collide with layer one, which is players. And I need to add a collision shape to it. So add collision shape. 2D and we're going to give it a shape and this time we'll just do a new segment shape which is a line right so here it is it's right here I'm going to go like this and I'm going to draw this line really big so that the player can't not touch it right and with the area 2D selected we're going to go to node and we're going to say body entered so when a body touches it we'll double click that and we'll say that we'll call this out of bounds. I guess I could make that a little clearer if I wrote it with underscores there. Connect. So now we have out of bounds. So again, we should check if it's a player touching it. So we can say if uh, not the body that is in group players then return. Again, we set it up so that the only collision layer it's touching is the players, so it shouldn't be an issue, but it doesn't hurt to check and make sure it's a player. So, if it's not a player, then just exit out of this. If it is a player, it's going to continue. We're going to say get tree, uh, and then we're going to say re reload current scene. So again, the tree, when we say get tree, we're saying get this, our entire tree here. What are we going to do? Well, we're going to reload the current scene. That's a built-in function. So now, when we go off the edge of the screen and we go down far enough, like so, if I did everything right, it just restarted the level. 
Now, you could put a delay on that and make some sound or say game over, uh, but I just want to show you the basic concepts of restarting the map when the player goes too far. And let's just make sure that I can't. Okay, good. I made the line far enough that I don't think I can jump past it. That's it for this tutorial. I just wanted to add something like that into here. Uh, I hope that you're enjoying this series. That was a basic little, a short little video here. I hope that you enjoy it. I hope that you have. Hello and welcome to this video from filmsbychris.com. That's Chris with the K. I'm Chris with the K. This video is part of a series. We've been working on this basic little game here. Today's video is going to get a little more advanced. And we're going to be a lot of doing a lot of coding. And I hope that I can explain things simply. But I think it'd be really great if we add multiplayer functionality to our game now before we get too far into the game. And we want to do that not network, but local, uh, we are going to have it so you can plug in multiple controllers and have multiple players. And there's different ways to do this. And the way I'm going to show you is a little more complex than the coding, but will save you headaches down the line, I promise. So real quick, since we're going to be having multiple players, we don't want the camera following one player anymore. Well, you could do split screen. I've done that before in Godot. We're not doing that this today. We're just gonna grab this camera, which is currently a child. You can see it's connected to the player. We're gonna grab that and put that back up on our map here. If I hit F5 now, you can see that the camera is here and I can move this player around. Now, if I hit escape, I can take this player or grab him from over here so I can just drag in another player. If I hit F5 now to start our game, I can use my keyboard and mouse to control the uh, player. One looks like he's moving faster than the other and I'll tell you exactly why I made a mistake. I drug him onto the player so he's the child of the player. So he's moving with the player so the player's moving and he's playing. We don't want that. We want him on the map here or actually on the tile layer would probably be better. Now let's try it again. So I'm using my mouse keys or my gamepad to control the second player, or both players. Doesn't matter which game controller I use. Now, the way most people will tell you to make multi-controller games in Godot uh, is to go to projects, and you can see if we go to map input, you can see the controls we made. And you can see right now I have it set so that Joy uh, button 13, which is D-pad left, is set to all devices. So it's looking at all devices. Now you can set it to look at the, the first device, the second device, which the first device is zero. So zero or one or two. And what you would do is come in here and instead of just having left, you'd have player one left, player one right, player one jump. And then you'd have more for player two left, player two right, player two jump. If you want a third player, you come in here and add more. So every player extra that you want, you have to come in here and add more controls we're not going to do that. What we're going to do right now is just disable our joypad. And again, there's different ways to do this, but this is how I'm going to do it in this controller. Now, if I hit F5 now, we can see the keyboard still works, but if I touch the buttons on any of my game controllers, nothing's working because we've disabled that. We're going to now also clean up our player code. So click on our player here, go to the script. Right now, so far, we've done everything in the physics process which is fine for a small game, but you really want to break things up into separate functions. A function is a group of commands that you can call at any point. And different people have different views on this, but in general, you don't want them to get too long. I heard a general rule once that a rule of thumb is maybe 20 lines at max. If it's more than 20 lines, you might want to break it up into smaller uh, functions. So what we're going to do right now is I'm going to come, I'm going to grab all this. I'm going to hit uh, Control X and to cut that. And then down here, I'm going to paste it back in. Then I'm going to come up here and I'm going to type in funk and I'm going to say keyboard inputs and I spelled funk wrong, funk. <laughs> and then I'm also going to put my animations right here into another function funk and I'm going to say play animations. Oops. Now for these functions to run, I have to put them, I have to call them up here. I'm going to say keyboard inputs and play animations. Now I'm going to put the keyboard inputs and the controller inputs into different functions for the tutorial. Technically you could combine them with if then statements within the functions, but let's go ahead and separate them out. So for right now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy my keyboard inputs and I'm going to rename this gamepad inputs. And again, I will put that to make sure it runs through our loops right here. Now, what we want to do is change this 
instead of saying input action just press, which is looking for the actions we set in the project there, we're going to say is joy button pressed. It's asking for a device number. I'm gonna say zero, comma, and then we'll give us a list of buttons. I'm gonna choose joy button B, okay? And I'm gonna do the same thing right down here. Now, before we had our game controllers each controlled uh, both players. But now, if I run this and I press the jump button on this controller, you can see it's controlling both our players still. We need to give each player its own ID. But so far, right now, it's only being controlled by one controller, not two. So let's come up here. Let's create a variable. We're going to say at symbol export var player underscore ID equals zero. Okay, remember the first controller is zero. So every time you plug in a game controller into your computer, the first one's gonna be zero. When you plug in a second one, it's gonna be one. If you plug in the next one, it's gonna be two, and then three, then four. Well, saying export here allows, when I go to the map here and I choose one of these, you can see over here, it has that variable player ID. I can set this guy to have an ID of two. Now when I, or one, which makes him second player. Now when I hit uh, a button on one of the controllers, it still controls both of them because I have to continue with our script. We're down here, we have it hard coded to zero. We're gonna set that to the variable of player ID. Now, if I hit jump on one controller, it controls one. And if I hit jump on the other controller, it controls two. Now we still haven't set up the left and right buttons. So let's go ahead and do that. And we're actually gonna change the way this works. Again, I told you in one of the first tutorials how we were using a template for uh, character animations and how we were gonna replace all of that eventually. That's what we're doing right now. So let me go ahead and I'm just gonna copy and paste some things here. So, yes, that's, that's what I want. Actually, instead of copy and pasting, what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna create a variable up here called direction, and I'm going to set it to zero. Down here, we're saying direction to left and right axes. We're not going to do that anymore. We are going to get rid of this, and we are going to get rid of this, and then we're going to say if input dot is action just pressed, no, sorry, pressed, we want left, we're going to say direction equals negative one. That will make the character go to the right, or left, I mean, duh. And then we're going to say else, and we can just copy this, and then change this to say right direction equals one. And then this can go here. Uh, what did I do wrong here? Expected, sorry, this should not say else, this should say else if. There we go. So now it's looping through and it's checking the keyboard press. If you press left, direction is gonna be negative one. If it's right, then it's gonna be one. And then we're gonna do our speed check here, but we actually don't want that here because we want to calculate both joystick and our joypad and, and keyboard. So we're gonna move this up here. I told you this was gonna get a little complicated. I hope this is not too much for beginners, uh, which is what this series is aimed towards. Now let's look at our joypad here. We have the jump. Our double jump actually doesn't work properly. Uh, so we're gonna to have to modify that. But what we're gonna do is we can now copy this and down here, replace this, but again, we're going to do is joy button pressed for both of these. And in here, we're going to say, again, player ID, and we're gonna say joy, and we're gonna do D-pad left. And then down here, we're gonna say player ID joy, and we're gonna look for D-pad right. Okay. Now, up here we said, is the button pressed? Not just pressed, because it's constantly looping and seeing if you're still pressing it. And that's exactly what these are doing down here. 
and get rid of these comments. The issue comes in with our double jump here. So if I was to hit F5 now, we should be able to take, pick up one controller and move the player left and right and jump, although he is still moving when I let go of the button. And that's because we have to, before we run either of those, reset direction to zero. So every time it loops, it resets to zero, then checks your controller again. So now I can pick up one controller, move him left, move him right, make him jump. I can grab the other controller, move him left, move him right, and make him jump. So we have multiplayer, but our double jump is broken, okay? The reason being is that it's looping here. So here we're saying, okay, check. Is button B pressed? And he's on the floor. Yes, set double jump to true. Do this, do this. And then it immediately loops again and thinks that you have just double jumped, like instantaneously. So it took me a minute to think through this. And this is what I came up with. Instead of having double jump be true or false, up here, where we have double jump, we're going to set it to zero. Then down here, what we're going to do, keyboard, joystick, we're going to say double jump, and we're going to add one to it. So, But first, we're going to set it to zero. So you're on the floor and you jump, we're going to set it back to zero. Down here, we're going to say, instead of double jump, true, we're going to say double jump equals one. And then here, we're going to say double jump plus equals one. And then we need to check to see if the player has let go of the button. So now a separate if statement, we're gonna say if, and we're gonna say joy button pressed and double jump equals zero. But we're not gonna just stop there. We're gonna come over here and say exclamation mark. That means not true. So we're saying basically if they release the button, then what are we going to do? We're going to set double jump plus equals one. Now if I hit F5, I should be able to double jump. Perfect. And same with the other player, double jump. But we have to fix the keyboard section now as well. So let's go ahead and exit out of our game. Because up here, we're still looking to see if it's true. So we want to rewrite this as well to similar. That's why we could put all this in one function and check different controls. But I think for clarity, I'm going to do this, set this to zero. What was it telling me here? Oh, I got to put this here now. And then, then I have to say, if input jump, we have action just pressed, we're gonna say, is action just released jump? And double jump equals zero, sorry, check it's zero. Then we're gonna say double jump plus equals one. I'm gonna to try to explain all this again in a moment. Let's go ahead and press F5 to start our game. Again, game controller works. Can we double jump? We can. And keyboard still controls all the players. But if you're playing single player, you still wanna be able to control it. Everything seems to be functioning properly. So we have multiplayer. Okay, I know this was a lot especially for beginners. And of course, you can always check my code online. I share everything. Check out the links in the description of this video for this code. Um, but let's review what we've done. We have set a player ID. We've exported it so we can change it in the map editor. By default, it's zero. But if we go to our map here, and let's say we wanted a third player, I can press Control D to clone this guy and move him over here. And then I can give him a next number and if I plugged in a third controller, it would control that. But the keyboard will control everybody. So coming in here, again, looking at this code. So each player has its own ID. We also set direction as a global variable to zero. Remember, negative one would make them go left. 
Regular one will make them go right, zero will stop them from moving. In our loop, we're going to reset direction to zero every time it loops. This is going to be like 60 times a second on a decent computer. Then we're going to run our keyboard and, input and gamepad input functions, which are almost identical. But here we're just checking, is jump pressed and they're on the floor? If so, set double jump to zero, play a sound, move them up. And then here we're going to say, OK, double jump, then add one. If when we release, we're going to do set this to zero. I actually don't think I need to do that, do I? Ah, it's, it's best if I do. <laughs> and um, down here, we're doing if input is joystick pressed. And we're checking the ID. You can see each time it's checking the ID. And that's why we can have as many players as we want. We're going to go joy button, joy button B, joy button B. These two are checking, is it pressed? And is he on the floor? Or can he double jump? If so, then jump again. If that button is not pressed, and double jump is zero. Well, then we're going to set double jump. We're going to add one to it. Really, we could just probably set it to one. Um, so that's basically looking at when you release the button while you're jumping. OK, then here we're going to check if a button is pressed, if it's button left, set the direction to left. If the button is right, set the button to right, but only for the controller with the matching ID. And then we have our animation stuff that we worked on in another video. Oh, I hope, I hope that wasn't too much. But making this game multiplayer, I think, is going to be more exciting than just playing a game by yourself. And it's something that a lot of people don't get into early on in, in their game design. And I think that they should because it's fun. So in the next video, what we might do is, since right now we have two players or as many players as we want, they both look identical, right? And I'm not going to create graphics for each player, but... I want to give them each their own unique color. So that's what we're going to do in the next video. I thank you for watching. Please visit filmsbychris.com. That's Chris the K. There's a link in the description. I hope that you have a great day. Hello and welcome to this video from filmsbychris.com. That's Chris the K. I'm Chris the K. Link in the description on my website. This video is part of a series I hope you've been following along. And I apologize for the last video being a little more advanced than most of the other videos. We're going to take things easy today. So we have it set up. Our keyboard controls all the players, but if we have separate game pads installed, we can have multiplayer where each player plays with a different game controller. But both our players look identical, which can get confusing if we're running around each other. Which one is me? I'm sure we've all done that in multiplayer games. Like, wait, which, which one's me? You need to make sure. Like, So what do we do uh, in, in games? You know, you know, we'll do different colors. So let's go ahead and look at how we can change player colors. If I choose this player and I choose the sprite, I come over here to where it says visibility and I can go down to modulate and I can modulate his color. I can make him pink or red or I can make him yellow or green just by changing these bars here. Now we can do that manually. We can go to the map and do it manually, but we want to do it with code. Again, if you have multiple players and you have 10 different players, you want them each to get their own color automatically created with a script. And this is super easy to do. So real quick, let's go into our player script. So we got our player here. We'll click on our player. We'll go here. And what we're going to do here is we are going to take our player sprite, which we already set to a variable called sprite. We're going to create another function here, function underscore ready. And what that does is this will run once when the player loads. And what we're going to do is we're going to say sprite dot modulate. And then we're going to say that we want it to be a color. So here we can set a color and we're going to say, you know, dot, well, we can pick a color from here. So I can do red. Now, if I start my game, the players are red. If I do blue, capital blue, they can be blue. But we want individual ones. So what I think, we could set them completely random for each player. So what we can do here, we can set specific ones for player one and player two and player three. But once you get some point, you want them to be random. So to make things random, you have to make sure that you run the randomize function first. Otherwise, it won't really be random and you'll get the same things over and over again. Now that we have that, instead of saying color blue, or again, you just type in color dot, you can pick 
from all these different colors preset. You can also give individual values if you want to get a very specific color with hex colors or RGB colors. We're not going to get into that because you have plenty of options right here. We are going to randomize some colors using what's called HSV, but we use the color function here. So we can say color from this, and then we're going to get a random number here. Don't worry too much about this. Random I gives us random integer, in, integer and then basically uh, we're dividing it by 12 and getting the remainder and then dividing that by 12 and we're getting that for this first little column here. Let's go ahead and now run our script. Our players each have their own color. I can press escape when I run it again, they should get new colors. So we aren't setting specific colors. And again, you can set specific colors, specific colors for player one and player two. But here, each player gets a random color and you can tell the difference between them. And that's awesome. So now that we have some color, let's go ahead and while we're at it, just to do something easy, let's choose our coin, sprite. And without any code, we're just gonna go visibility modulation. Let's look at it. Let's give our coin, let's make it like a gold color, right? Maybe a little more orange color here. So now our little mono color game has some color to it. Our characters have their own color. And again, we can add a hundred different players and they'll each, I mean, theoretically, since we're doing it randomly, some of them could end up getting the same color, especially if there's a hundred of them. But if you have a handful of players, they should all get unique colors and now you have a multiplayer game. Let's add one more thing, because this video would be really short if I didn't. Right now our players don't collide with each other, which you may want. You may not want your players colliding with each other, but let's set it up so our players will collide with each other. If we come here and we go to their uh, the player here and we go to collision, right now they are not set to collide with other players. If we click this mask, since they're on layer one, now, oh see, sometimes you will get the same color more than once. Uh, we will, our players now collide with each other. So you can stand on each other's heads if you want. Our game's looking pretty good if you ask me. And again, uh, we do have it set if we fall off the edge here. Oh, I thought we had it set so if we fall off the edge, the map would restart. Ah, the line's there. Hmm. Did we find a bug in our game? Let's see, let's troubleshoot this. Let's go to our map here, let's look at it. We have this line here, which is uh, area 2D. If we come over here, go to inspector, we go to nodes, we'll go to signals. You can see out of bounds. And here it says, okay, check if it's in the players group, which our player should be in the player group. Let's go ahead and just add a print function here. We're gonna print test. So now when a player touches that, we should in our output console down here, I get the word test. So I'm gonna go ahead and run off there. I'll hit escape. We got test, so that's working. Let's put it past this function. Let's put it, oh, you know what? I see the problem right now. Somehow I must have deleted this at some point. Get tree dot reload current scene. Okay, that was our problem right there. I must have deleted that by accident at some point. There we go. Uh, so yeah, we've got some color in our simple little game here. If you go out of bounds, you're going to restart the map. Obviously, well, I'm still on the map here. Our camera isn't exactly lined up because we moved it when we lined it up with that player. What we can do is just go like this. There we go. That's a little bit better. Now again, we do occasionally get the same colors for both players. You could change that by doing something like this in our players we can say if player ID equals zero, then sprite modulate equals color. And we can say that player one is always, you know, this aqua blue color. And then we can say else or L if player ID equals one, then sprite modulate equals color dot green. And you can do that for player two, three, four, and then you can say else 
then give them a random color. So you can set the first five or ten players to have set colors, and after that they go random. Right now we'll set it to, to just check the first two. So let's go to our map, and we'll create a few more players here. And here they're still going to be looking like they're white, because that's the default color. But let's go ahead and create a few more players here. And now when we start it up, the first two players will always be the same color, and the, the third and fourth player would be random. Uh, let's go ahead and jump off the edge here. Oh, they're not being random. What did we do wrong? Player script. Let's go ahead and move our random function up here. So if, if player is zero, then aqua. If player is one, then that. Else, modulate random. Hmm. Oh. Ah, uh, I know why. Uh, let's go, players. Uh, we we didn't give them new IDs, right? So here we'll make this guy two and this guy three. Now, there we go. So again, this guy ended up accidentally being the same color as that guy, but it's random. So again, you can set solid uh, list of colors or you can set them to be random in a way. Anyway, now I think the video has been long enough, hopefully easier than the multiplayer video. Again, that wasn't too complicated. You can always check the code I have online. Uh, I hope that you're enjoying these videos. I hope you continue to watch and I hope that you have a great day.